and welcome to another video in the Synthetic Biology Lecture Series from the University of Washington. My name is Tyler, and today we are going to talk about the LAC repressor, or LAC-I. LAC-I. So, LAC-I was first isolated by Walter Gilbert in 1966, but Jacques Minard was the first person to actually propose the LAC operon during World War II. He was studying the two-phase growth of bacteria, actually E. coli, um, when grown on a plate or medium that contained two different sugars. So the sugars that he was looking at were glucose, which I'll show in green, and lactose, which I will show in orange. So the medium had both of those, and then he plated E. coli onto it, which I'll show in red. So he had little E. coli colonies on it. And he noticed that they actually grew in two separate phases. That is, they consumed all of the glucose first, and then began consuming the lactose as a secondary option. So after researching this for some time, he discovered the lac operon, or proposed that the lac operon was uh, actually causing this double stage in growth. So how it actually works is, I'll just scroll down here a little bit and show you. Um, so we have first a promoter, and then this lac i. So this is lac i, and the promoter has a little arrow, and this produces uh, a protein, which is called lac I protein, which forms a tetramer complex. So for every four of these, four identical pieces that are made, they group together and create this tetramer protein, um, which acts on another site in the DNA called lac, which is called the lac I operon. So this works to inhibit that in green, inhibit. And if you remember from the S-ball notation video that I did previously, uh, inhibition is denoted by this stick with a bar on the end. So it inhibits this, um, which is a protein that we have over here. So in the actual lac operon, it's uh, lac, Z, A, and Y. But in reality, it can be replaced with any other gene sequence that you want to be controlled by this lac I. So, well, if we have lac I creating this and it inhibits our protein production, isn't that bad? Well, no, because it actually allows us to control whether or not this is being expressed within the cell. So, Jacques Minard actually did most of his work with lactose being the triggering molecule that caused this to be released, so it inhibits the inhibitor. But in lab situations, it's mostly IPTG. So IPTG, I will draw in red. They're these little molecules that look a lot like lactose, except that they don't get digested by the cell. And so they can bind on to this lac I protein, which makes it change its conformation. So it physically changes its shape, and it's no longer able to match up its little sequences on here that line up with the DNA, so it cannot inhibit. When it can't inhibit, it means that RNA polymerase, I'll just draw that as a big glob, so this is RNA polymerase. Um, if this is no longer present here, then RNA polymerase is able to bind onto the promoter sequence and then transcribe and tra uh, induce transcription or and translation of this protein product. So no IPTG means that this big globular protein is in the way and RNA polymerase can't actually move down the line, and if IPTG is causing lac I to not bind, then it's, a lot, it's able to go down and transcribe uh, the gene sequences that are farther downstream. So this really isn't all that helpful, um, except if we want to turn on, like either turn straight on a gene or turn off a gene, unless we actually understand how much IPTG uh, we need to add in order to transcribe a certain amount of protein product. So research has been done and lots of research has been done and this is just a particular example but um, they varied the concentration of the IPTG that they added into the system. This is in micromoles and they recorded the amount of mRNA that they were able to collect per cell and took averages and whatnot. And so they found that any amount below, what is this, it's about 0 0.0001 maybe 0.0005 or something, 
uh, any amount below that just really didn't have much of an effect, which if you think about it, it makes a lot of sense. So say we have a thousand of these tetramer complexes around. If we only have, say, two molecules of IT, IPTG floating around, it's really not going to change. It's only going to change maybe like one or two of them at a time. So we still have 998 of these tetramers that are perfectly able to bind on to this operon in order to suppress the transcription and, er, and translation of our gene downstream. Whereas if we increase the amount of IPTG in the system, we can actually uh, take up more of those tetramers and induce more transcription, but only to a certain point. I mean, if we keep adding more and more IPTG to the system, it's not like we can continually increase infinitely the amount of protein product that we make. I mean, it'll only work to a point. RNA polymerase can only work so quickly, and uh, all your ribosomes can only work so quickly. The cell can only output the uh, protein at a certain rate depending on, say, like the promoter and uh, other factors. So it makes sense that we are limited to some degree. Um, but in general, the LAC operon is a highly used tool in synthetic biology, and especially the LAC I as a way of determining the uh, relative amount and what time uh, that is like when in our experiment we want this protein product to be expressed.